we've tried these last few tapings to uh, the last couple of sessions. This is Mike. Uh, again, we tried these night sessions to talk about the ultimate triumph under three headings. Prophesied in the Old Testament, and inaugurated in the Gospels and in the Acts, and and uh, and this teaching consummated in the Epistles and the Revelation. Now, I'm assuming, of course, that we all believe that the kingdom started with the coming of the King, and then when Jesus said the the time was come. He meant that the time has come. <laughs> he meant the time that we talked about when we dealt with the Old Testament prophecies. That time had arrived. And all things that the Old Testament prophets spoke about futuristically started to be fulfilled with the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. When Peter said on the day of Pentecost, uh, men of Israel, know this, that Jesus, whom you crucified, has God has made both Lord and Christ. Christ is anointed King, Messiah, Messiah. So the king started, kingdom started dynamically. It started potentially when John introduced Jesus. It started potentially, but it didn't start dynamically in its permanent form until Christ sat down at the right hand of God and Father, and so he said, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, what do we know about the, the consummating aspect of the kingdom? Do we have any idea where it's going, what, what it's like, and... Any word from God about what we should expect and what we can't expect? And do we have any inspired scenario or, or scenarios? Maybe just one scenario about the end. Is there any kind of divine agenda at all? Have, have we any systematic understanding of how it's, it's going to move along those lines? are all important questions, every one of them important. And they're exercised the minds of the greatest Christian thinkers from the days of Christ. And, and you've got to have a considerable library in literary history of men wrestling with these problems biblically. Uh, then, of course, philosophically and extensively and existentially and sociologically and many other ways men have uh, applied their thinking and whatever a apparatus they, they're using even in their regeneracy to try to anticipate what's going to happen to the world. Scientists, cosmologists, they want to anticipate whether the world's going to burn up or freeze up. And they got all their theories, but you, you see the problem with unregenerated prognosticators is that they are confined to the realm of their senses. I talked to my wife about this the other night. They can only make limited judgments based on the em empirical evidence that they can acquire through their senses you know, and history. Whatever the... Whereas the spirit-filled Christian who applies his mind to the Word of God has a dimension of information that the unregenerated man, he doesn't have. Now, we sometimes sell it so short on that. Uh, I say, well, I don't have a PhD. I, I don't even have a graduate degree in any of the sciences. In fact, I don't even have an arts degree. In, in fact, well, I, don't, I didn't even finish high school. And I don't want to encourage the sloth in the area of education, and I don't at all. But at the same time, I don't want Barr to be 
I don't want to reach what you understand, and I don't want you to not understand this. The most illiterate charwoman who, who maybe had no education at all and has more born, has more, she's a born again Christian now, has more cosmic information in her little finger than most of the erudite academics has in his whole swollen head. And it's true. Any little child woman, any woman child woman who knows God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, she plunged in the cosmic understanding and information that the outstanding philosophers of the world don't know about. Now, I don't want you to feel that, that we're ruled out, any of us, and because we don't have graduate degrees or all these things. We've got the Word of God. Now, I don't want to sound offensive about it. I just want to, to say this. I'm a canonical person. I stay within the boundaries of this, this book. Now, if I ever stray out of the boundaries of this book to listen to what other people have to say outside of the judgment, I judge what they say by this book. They think it's narrow or bigoted, obscuritous, antiquated. doesn't matter to me. They can say what they want to. Everything that I believe has to be according to the Christ and Christos. Christ is the touchstone of all knowledge. And it's lack of Christ that the center of controversy and contemporary knowledge that has brought us to the helpless state that we're in right now, all over the world, and our society. All right, when, when you consider the kingdom consummated and consummate, you want to look at two things. First, you want to look at the gradualism of the other process, and then you want to look at the crisis. The whole matter of the kingdom has to do with the historical process and the final crisis right there. So we start out with, now if you're going to take a note, just put a capital A there. Put a Romans 3 first, uh, which is consummated pro processively. And this introduces us to a theory of Gradualism, well, it's not even a theory. It's to observe the, the uh, gradualism in the Bible. It calls for us to observe, number one, the biblical illustrations of this gradualism. Now we talk about uh, creation because creation is our number one illustration, which we would be under one. Creation, while we talk about fiat creation, you know, but by that we mean that God, by a fiat sovereign power, spoke the words into existence. They, they didn't, uh, they didn't evolve out of some nebulous something. They it came into being by an act of God, when something was not there one second, and the next second something was there. That's that's a fiat creation. Fiat creation is the position of one who's biblically oriented. But we we have in fiat creation, but interestingly enough, it was not fiat in the sense that it was all there on the second second. It took him six days. And so right from the beginning, we see a gradualism in creation. Now, if we were a 24-hour person, it's still gradualism. If you're a ge geological age person, it's still gradualism. But God who spoke things into existence did it in a gradual way over a period of six days. And on the seventh, he, he rested. The second thing is a gradual, which would be D, if you're taking notes at all. The second thing would be the revelation of God. That God created in the sixth day, in six days, and early he started to communicate. He did. God is not only a creator of the universe, but he communicator to that which he created which is equally important with 
his creation. Well, it's tremendous that he created, but you can imagine what he'd be like if he, if he created us and given us a shout to <laughs> shove into, into the universe and said, lots of luck, let us wander through space on our own. Having created, he communicated his purpose in creation. All our trouble tonight, the massive trouble that so many people have spoke about lately, and 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 there's some devastating teachings about it. Now that's all the result of rational men on a God-given creation not listening to the communication of the Creator at all. What well, God created, He communicated to His rational vice regent, which we are, man, how to govern it. And man, I've thrown away the manual. He's got a bicycle, but he threw away the manual that tells him how to put it together and how to ride it. So he can't do anything. He can't get the bicycle together. And Scribbers for this is Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Huh. God who at sundry times, that's graduism, sundry times, graduism, and in diverse manners spoke unto our fathers by the prophets. Now, he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now, those verses, those two verses cover 1,500 years. God, who at sundry times, diverse manners, in times past, he talked to the fathers by the prophets, having these last days spoken to us by his son. Well, God dropped a little here and a little there and a little here. Uh, there's a classic book called The Progress of Doctrine in the New Testament. It's, it's not a new book. It's over, over 100 years old. It's by a canon. Bernard. It's from, by Bernard. Yeah, B-E-R-N-A-R-D. It's a classic. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sure you can buy it today. They keep republishing and republishing it. Because it's something like the Bible. It's it's because such a classic. And the thesis of that book is very simple, but very necessary. Not a very big book. But it's, it's important that we understand this. It's God starts growth of the seed in the shoot and then the branches and so on and so on. As she's referred to it as graduism. And this is graduism. Gradualistic process of that God has given us illustration of in nature. But Bernard has illustrated and established classically for us that it's the same with Revelation. That Revelation starts with Genesis, which is the seed plot of the Bible like we dealt with other night in the last teachings in Genesis 3.15. Now, if we couldn't take subsequent Revelation and go back and look at 3.15... We would be as puzzled probably as Adam and Eve were when God said it to them. But we live here, and we've lived to see that day when the woman's seed had crushed the serpent's head. But all down through the centuries, there is an accumulation. There's an accumulation, and there's a widening, like Ezekiel's river. The revelation becomes richer and richer and richer until the eventually and eventuates in the coming of Messiah. And he becomes the final voice of God. But even in their graduation, gravitatory, of what he says is recorded in the gospel, he himself says, it's not the full thing yet. I have many things to tell you. Uh, he had to say to you, but you're not ready and not able to bear them. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, so so Jesus, he just has warned them. He, he said, look, I am what you say I am, and I'm who you say I am. I'm the son of God, but I can't tell you everything. Not because I, I couldn't tell you, but because you're not presently able to receive it. And that's not totally your fault. It's because the revelation hasn't come. So you can't receive any more that I've given you. But when the Comforter has come, you'll all be personally equipped with a advanced technical receiver. 
there are radio waves and TV signals and all kinds of waves that pass through us and around us all the time. You can't receive them because you're not equipped to receive them. You get an antenna for a television and, and for a, a radio set and you tune in your radio set to that frequency, you can pick it up and it can process it and, and put it out for you to hear it turn into radio waves and sound waves where you can process that. That's going on around you all the time. But yet when you're just sitting there, you don't pick it up. You don't read it. You can't hear it. The same process. He's going to send the Holy Spirit to process the things from heaven for you. You can talk to him and he can talk to you. He can hear you all the time, but you can't hear him until you get regenerated and get filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't even see the kingdom of God unless hear it. Well, you have apostolic voices, and they, they'll talk to you. And James and Peter, and James, somebody you don't even know right now. A uh, bow-legged, beetle-nosed, hook-nosed little Jew. And that's not being prejudiced, but he doesn't know it yet. He's a rabbi. He doesn't know it. It'll make him an apostle to the Gentiles. Well, it's amazing that Jesus in the days of his flesh already stamped Paul's words with the imp- promoter of his authority and he was a, a rabbi and hated Jesus and that's amazing that makes you hope it does in all your goings and your outreaches you may be winning an apostle of Christ now the Billy Graham we've said that many of us did it's not just winning the soul and saving him from hell but you may be winning somebody who's earmarked earmarked for divine things well so Revelation is an illustration of gradualism. Gradualism. See, they take it over the land of Canaan, Deuteronomy 7.22. And the Lord thy God will, will put out those nations before thee, well, little by little, by little and, and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon me one of the necessities of gradualism is that you shouldn't conquer what you're not prepared to control let's say that again you you shouldn't conquer what you're not prepared to control how many of us in in our greed have done this uh, i took a, a nine-year-old to a smoke board he was my nephew and by the time we got to our table, I looked at his stuff and said, Oh, you've overdone. You can't do this. If we conquer what we cannot control, and he conquered what he couldn't control, we come away with a trophy of this bulging platter, but we get it to the table, and we, we say, If I eat that, it'll kill me. And I told him that if you eat that, it'll kill you. Now God said this, and it wasn't some kind of mosaic strategy. God said... I want you to go in there with a, with your expensive greed and beat up the Canaanites and, and then find out that you don't have the resources. Do you know the ratio of the suppliers of fighting men in an army? Just average. Uh, men out front fighting with airplanes and all that that goes with the infantrymen. There's probably seven to ten people, sometimes four, up to ten. We'll just say overall ten. Well, that's a lot. Now, see the beauty of this organized church, of a well-organized church, is that just the, you got a good general who's capable of in his strategies and the things that I see a lot of ministers do, and men like them are good men. It's not just to get people to come in or preach to different churches. The people that come and and be part of the part of the army and not necessarily the out front ones, but the entire support apparatus is in is essential for the success of any army in the field. They don't conquer what they don't plan to control and can't. Even Jesus said, "Count the cost." Uh, it, it's 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 so prophesied of the Messianic Kingdom twice, and I've just chosen two, Daniel's Stone and Ezekiel's River. Now, 
Daniel Stone, Daniel 2.35, Then was the iron and the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold, it was broken to pieces together, and they became like half of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smoked the image, because it became, it, it, it became, let's say it became, it became, gradualism, it became. It became it became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Now here's the gradualism. All the human systems all the human systems of government which have been tried through the centuries and, and they failed over and over and over. Well they're gonna be blown away like like a chaff in, in the wind. There'll be no place found for them and the stones that crushed them is going to grow until it fills the whole earth. Now, we're not even crisis yet. We're not in that. We're still talking about gradualism. And don't make that a crisis because that's not a crisis. That's gradualism. And you see, we have the... And we've opted out of gradualism. It's dispensationalism which is many moment coming attitude and the Lord's going to whisk us out of this I think it's paralyzed our our gradualism and we have no plans for the future huh about 30 years ago 35 years ago an evangelical was about about 200 years have said that we don't plan anything the watchword was that you don't polish brass on a sinking ship who has the right to call God's creation a sinking ship? Well, it's not this sinking ship. It may be in trouble, <laughs> true, but it's being rescued. I watch it more and more every day. But what evangelicals do, they opted out of, of the public square. No more of public square. Uh -uh. Uh, I wanted to talk about this several times, but we didn't get to. They opted out of the public square. Hmm. One of our very influential modern theological, sociological writers, and I like Walt, Walter Martin. He's just a great apologist. And, and uh, First Things is another book that they walk about the naked public square, in which he said to the shame of Christianity, it was left the public square, we did, to unregenerates. Well, they took it over. Yeah, uh, I want to talk about I remember when I talked about the North Eastern University. That's when I was trying to in the last two or three tapings. We lost it all because we uh, we left it out of the public square. We said, we have nothing to say to you. Why don't you just go on to hell, fellas? Now, that's brassly, but that's the premise of the dispensationalism. We can't help you. You want to get saved? Join us and this any moment church you you come join us but we got no plans for education we got no plans for agriculture uh, we don't have any plans for finances we got no plans for sociology we're not going to talk to you about how you live and that's the very reason jesus has left us here is so that we can live in the, the whole thing 11 the lump we're we're too confounded pharisaical to get our religious robes touch soiled by touching this world, go out, go out and get them dirty. You wash them at night when you come home. I don't know how to address you about abortion. I don't even know how you address abortion, but you've got to address it. You, out of your Christian consciousness, must have an attitude towards it and be prepared to address it. And that's something you've got to wrestle with. Oh, we have a lot of issues right now. We do. About 35 years ago, a bunch of, maybe the time's a little longer, but uh, a bunch of evangelicals got together and they said, look, we've read this, this, this any moment thing and it's long enough. We're so embarrassed now. We, When the newspapers and news reporters come to talk to us about what we think about a public issue, that we're not interested. We've we lost our voice in that, and boy, you could hear a lot of voices, and they're bad. Well, they don't come to us anymore. But they know that that Baptist church, the Pentecostal church, 
Well, he doesn't give a hoot what happens to society. So they don't come anymore. They're not going to come talk to you. Do you know at the turn of the century, last century, the Great Britain, the Sunday morning press, and here in America too, they regularly reported on sermons of, uh, on Charles Spurgeon, Sir Monica Material, and Parker, and Dr. Uh, Gillet, and Jowett. The front page news here in America as well. Yeah. They talk about a sermon. But the only time we hit the press now is when somebody screws up and has an affair on some or stole some money. They left their wife or did some with their secretary. We don't make a positive contribution. We're part of the stone, though. We're part of the stone. The Jesus is, is the stone. Yeah, Jesus is the stone. And uh, he is a stone. But his corporate body, that's us. We're not breaking anything up. No. We're getting broke up. So, the Evangelicals, five or six years ago, again, 30, 30 years ago, 46 years ago, I shot the first time a book entitled Evangelical Agenda for Society. Evangelical Social Agenda, period. Now, they were pressured into it. They could no longer hide behind any moment coming of Christ sessions. Here we go. They were ashamed to, to having to say something. In a public square. Well, now we dealt with Ezekiel's river. But you talk about gradualism. River came down from under the altar. Remember, it issued down and came forth up to the ankles, the loins, the knees, the swaddles of swimming. Everywhere it went, it grew all kinds of fish and just a prolific demonstration, prolific demonstration of life, wherever the river went. How did it start? It started as it came from out from underneath the cross of Calvary, the altar, and its redemptive started to flow through the Pentecost and, and on down through the apostolic revelation and down through the centuries. And it flowed and it flows and it's going to keep on flowing until the Dead Sea, whatever is of death on the earth, has been enlivened by the life of God. You say, really? I don't, maybe we could handle our neighbors and do well. Well, that's part of it, but a good place to start, but you got to have the big picture. Huh? All right. Yeah, this is hard. Let's, let's take a, take a look at the two of the kingdom parables by Jesus. We're dealing with gradualism, remember? Two of the kingdom parables. Matthew 13 and 31 and 32. The mustard seed. Uh, another parable I put me forth in saying, the kingdom of God is like a, a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which needed the least of all the seeds. But when it's grown, it is the greatest herb of among herbs becomes a tree that becomes a tree so the birds of the air come and lodge in it and the branches thereof it's the smallest seed Christianity it looked like a consequential philosophical deviation in history that's what it looked like that that seed grew and grew and, and grew and we may be some kind of retardation movement in America but in Africa and South America and South Asia and the kingdom of God is really rapid. I have every reason to believe that it's probably by the grace of God that it's going to run start rampant through the recent communist nations, which which and there's several of them fighting right now. But I believe God's going to pour his spirit out there too. Uh, some of us saw it. Uh, there's a lot of people thought that we'd have to capitulate to communists, but. Uh, <sighs> The seeds of his own destruction in communism. I can't live. It's, it's parasitical. And it parasited, parasited because it's a parasite. It can't produce anything. It can keep itself alive. So it keeps the them up others. Cut different countries. It swallows them up to keep itself alive and rapes the land and rapes the people. But it kills us eventually. Now the second one, the kingdom parable, is Matthew thirteen thirty-three, The parable of the leaven. Now before I say anything about the leaven. 
Right in your head, batches of leaven is a type of sin, right? That's what came into your head, leaven, sin, yes. And the lie is a type of the devil. But, having said that, the lion is a type of Jesus. Let me say something about the metaphors and symbols. They all have a negative and a positive. Water is judgmental. The flood of water, woo. Water is life-giving water as well. Water out of the rock. The lion is the conquering beast. Jesus, lion of Judah. Satan, lion of the negative. Fire. Fire fire's a type of judgment. But fire is a type of perdition as well. Attention. It's tension. Don't get yourself fixed. There's it's never a metaphor that doesn't have a negative and a positive. You got to you, you got to determine that. Determine that as context. Now let's say that eleven that eleven is sin. Should we say eleven is sin? Say it now. Eleven is sin. Now, let's read the Bible. Another parable speaking unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like a sin, right? Uh, no. <laughs> so. How many believe the kingdom of heaven is a sin? It's like sin. So the context says you better do something about that word, leaven, huh? The context. Is leaven is leaven. Leaven's leaven, leaven. It's just leaven. What does leaven do? Tell you, you people that bake bread, and I love to bake bread. And, and, uh, it's, it's so. Uh, Jeremy says this, a little sourdough, it pervades the whole thing. Uh, that's good, isn't it? A little sourdough, <laughs> 11. Now, the kid with heaven is like an 11, right? Which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole was 11. One of the processes when you're making bread is you need to need it. You have to need it. You gotta need it. And that's the part and we don't like that part too much, kneading. Right? Now it's a test esoterical joke and there's nothing funny about it. <laughs> Number, number three is growth. Matthew four twenty six through twenty nine, and he said to the so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise by night and day, and the seed, seed should spring up and grow. He doesn't know how. He knows not how. He knows not how. Said together, he knows not how. Do you know how it works? I don't think you know how it works either. There's a mystery. That God is constantly trying to get through to us. He is. Jesus told Nicodemus. He said, the wind, it blows where it wants. We hear the sound thereof. But but we know not from whence it comes or, or whether it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. There's a mystery in this. I know not how God's wondrous grace to me he has made known. Uh, an old Scotchman said that I did all the, I could all thing against all the converted, and God did all that he did for me, because he did everything for me, and he won. Now I want you to watch this, verse 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of itself. First the blade, gradualism, rhythm, we talk, we're talking about gradualism. First the blade, then the ear, after the, the the full corn in the ear, but when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he put forth in the sickle and it becomes a harvest. The harvest has come. Now, um, I believe that's an age-long gradualism, but I believe that everything is not only age-long, but it's episodic. That the age-long is repetition of the episodic repetition over and over again. In the last days, perilous times shall come. 
Well, we've been in the last days over, over 2,000 years, and we've had perilous days, but we've also had our revival days. Don't don't look at it in the short term. And uh, uh, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. And the final one on gradualism is shining light at the at uh, the Proverbs 4.18, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of the day is shining ever brighter and brighter. That's gradualism. Brighter and brighter. Uh, John 1.5, his light is the light that shines through the darkness, and the darkness, well, it can never extinguish it. 1 John 2.8, for the darkness is beginning to lift, and, and the true light is now shining in the world. Now, let's say the true light is shining in the world. The true light shining in the world. Say it. True light shining in the world. And what happens to the darkness in relation to the, the light? Well, it, it can't extinguish it. But rather, the darkness is, is lightened, as well as the light grows in the darkness... Darkness recedes. Gradualism. Gradualism. Okay, all right, now let's look at the critical. It's the, uh, the critical. The critically. Now critically. Critically. The parousia. Now the parousia is probably the major Christian word for... Uh, for the second coming of Christ. There are several words. Parousia. Epiphormia. Apocalypsis. They all speak of the same thing. But parousia. Is a word that was used. Of a king in his revenue. When they came to a certain place. Right. That was the parousia. It's really the arrival it's apocalypsis. Now that's the unveiling. Here, parousia is is the arrival. Now, First Thessalonians four thirteen to eighteen. Now you all know this, but I wonder, brothers and sisters, if you ever sit down as rapturous and. Uh, wrapped us and really read this and, and instead of reading into it uh, everything that popular dispensationalism reads into it let it speak to you well this is probably old hat to a lot but i was amazed at the scriptures that i took for granted the first year but after that i, got, I started reading into it 40 years ago and uh, the particular persuasion that i was in they, they proof texted to my viewpoint then I got around to reviewing the proof text a little bit, a lot, and I realized that I bought somebody else's definition. When I started to go through this process, and my process of of, uh, of retreat from dispensationalism, I was, uh, was chagrined when, when eventually I realized I could no longer hold that position. Never. I couldn't do it anymore. I won't ever forget it. Uh, I had gone to a to a nice little church, and, and they they built that on that, the rapture, the rapture, the rapture, the rapture, and uh, dispensation, 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 they were just beat into me, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. And six months to a year, I just read, 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 work, read, work, read, work, I had no children at the time. I just work, 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 read, read, read. And that this had to stop. It had to stop. I had to get this out of the Bible, not books. And, and I was chagrined about it because I couldn't write a book. And I owe those people an apology there that I had followed along with this and talked about it. That I need to tell everybody uh, enough of that. And I was sorry for it. Now, any of you that had a history of dispensationalism, you know they make a difference between the para and the uh, apocalypse and the ones becoming for the church and the others coming with the church and the others coming for the Jews and they got a system, but when you check the system, it's not not sound. And so I started with the second. Uh, I tell you what shocked me was the city 
my study read an article that said the five comings of Christ. It had this five rapture, the four rapture, three rapture. I kept looking at all of them going, what? Uh, people laughed at me, but, 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 uh, and you shouldn't laugh either. It's offensive to people. Now, I looked at the article and said, boy, you're dubby. There's not five comings. And a little voice inside me said, how many you got? <laughs> I said, four. I have four. That's what I've counted so far. I keep looking through all these little things. Ah. Uh, <laughs> See, what I did was I said, dummy. Dummy. There are three. Here, now. See, we're in my research. Now, I started on the second coming and I found that parousia, eponia, and apocalypsis. I think there's another one, air coal minus, I think so. They all refer to the same time. And I ended up in Hebrews and I found my affirmation about the second coming it was just as simple as it's what it said there. And he shall come the second time apart from sin unto deliverance. Uh, that's it. Well, I said I found my roots right there. Now, I had to work through Antichrist and beasts and prophets and Armageddon and blood and battles and secret raptures and partial raptures and mid-tribulation raptures and, oh, man, six months to a year of torture trying to get it down right as I pulled my teeth and pulled my hair and, and put a gun to my head again and again. But at the end of six months... I was ready, ready. I wanted to define that, to defend that eschatology. I really did. Now I was young and bold, and, and could talk to the people that I love so deeply. We talked together to get to talk about this. There's no dispensationism. All right, let's read First Thessalonians four. Now we don't want my brethren to be in doubt. Any doubt about those who fall asleep in death or to grieve over them like men with no hope at all. After all, we believe that Jesus died and rose again from the death and that we can believe that God would just assuredly bring with Jesus all who are asleep in him. Uh, here we have a definite message from the Lord. It is those who are still living when they... Uh, they're not going to anyway receive those that have fallen asleep or dead. Now one more command, one shout from the archangel, one blast from a trumpet of God, the Lord himself will come down from heaven, bringing with him, of course, all those who have fallen asleep in him. Those who died before in Christ will be the first to arrive, and then we who are still alive will be swept up with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and after they've swept up, we'll be with him forever. So all beings use this message to encourage one another. Now, what it doesn't say is that that we shall be ever before with him in heaven. It doesn't say that. Now, we've read that into it. We'll be with him forever in heaven. Now, if you're caught up to meet somebody in the air, you're going to meet them as they're coming. They're still coming. Meet them in the air. Now, I don't want to say any more than that. Now, number two, the day. First Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10. God is just. Now, I want you to hear this. It's one of the most important scriptures. The dispensationalists don't major on God. They don't mention it. God, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to those who troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty and the power. On that day, on the day, on the day he comes. Now, when's this going to happen? On the day he comes. When's it going to happen? Now, when's it going to happen? On the day when he comes. Now, the whole dispensational position is that after Jesus' rapture, so we'll be raptured out. 144,000 flaming Jews evangelists that are going to evangelize the people that are left. But the folks, there's nobody left. There's no one left. Come on, don't fight me on this. Look, look at the text. Don't look at me or look at this. <laughs> look through this at me. Let's see what he says. They punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will punish with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of power on high on the day that he comes. <laughs> Who's left to evangelize? 144,000 Jews aren't even left on that day when he comes. We glorify his people and glorify by his people and they marveled at among those who are left and have left believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Now, the final day, the, the day of Christ coming, is finished. It's finished. It's done. That same day, he's going to punish all those who believe not the gospel. Now, that takes care of that, doesn't it? He's going to do whatever he's going to do. They have it mentioned. They have met him in the air, of course, and of course that brings to the new heaven and new earth. That he's going to do that. He's going to be glorified the believers. So that's what's left. There's nobody left to be evangelized. Okay, all right. Well, let's move to the final scenario here. And I'm doing this all pretty fast. I'm sorry, I had to look it up. I'm being very bold on this one, but and I want to be. And I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. I want to say this to you here. This section uh, is the uh, locus classic of, of uh, eschatology. Now, that is, a, this is where it winds up. So let's read it first in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. But the glorious fact is that Christ did rise from the dead. He has become the very first rise of all sleep, the sleep of death. Or the King James says this, it's the first fruits as death entered the world through a man, so has risen from the dead, come to us through a man. As members of a sinful race, all men die. As members uh, of Christ who die, all men should be raised to life. Each one in his proper order, Christ the very first, and after him, all who belong to him when he comes, then and not until then comes the end. Not, not until then. I haven't time to support all this, but I'm going to say to you very quickly that the second coming and the end are coterminous. That is, the second coming is the end, and the end is the second coming. Both. Then comes the end when Christ, having abolished all of the rule, authority, and power, hands over the kingdom to God the Father. Christ's reign will and must continue until every enemy has been conquered. The last enemy of all to be destroyed is death itself. Now, let me give you an eschatological agenda. You can fool with it as you like, but let me give it to you as I have derived it from the text. Here's the order. One, Christ the, the first fruit. Two, Christ's heavenly reign. What's, what's Jesus doing in heaven? He's reigning. He's heavenly reign. Number three, bring all enemies, putting all enemies under his feet. Putting all enemies under his feet. That's three. Four. Number four, abolishing all other governments. Remember the stone? The stone that smites the image and they're blown away as chaff? That's another way of saying that all of the governments are destroyed, abolished. So, abolishing all of the governments. Five, the, the parousia, the resurrection of, of they that are Christ. The, the parousia. The parousia and resurrection of they that are Christ. Six, the last enemy is destroyed, death is destroyed in that resurrection. Six, the last enemy is destroyed. Points five and six are occurred as well. They're synchronous and they're coincidental. Seven, we didn't read, did we at all? Did we? we didn't read that seven. Seven, verse 24. Handing over the kingdom to the Father. Uh, that mystery to me, huh? Handing over the kingdom to the Father. And eight. This is the end. Hmm. 
what ensues now? What are we going to do? This is this is point four, new heavens and new earth. And look at my material. I'm going to truncate my material. My time's pretty much up. Now I want to give you this, this scripture here. Second Peter 3, verse 13. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward. What are we looking forward to? What are we looking forward to? This, this, this is God's word. Look at it. Peter says this. We're looking forward to something. Well, when somebody's looking forward to something, it's the coming of the Lord. That's the crisis right there. What are we What are we looking forward to as a subsequent ultimate of this crisis? You're looking forward to a a new new heavens and new earth. Well, I don't want to be simplistic, but how many of us are not looking forward to a new earth? Our whole evangelical emphasis is to get saved and go to heaven. <laughs> go to heaven. Peter says that we get saved to go where? A new heaven and a new earth. Hmm. New earth. Now, let me read again, but in keeping with our promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. The home of the righteous. I'm quoting from the NIV. The home of the righteous. The home of the righteous. Well, where are you going, brothers and sisters? Where do you eventually expect to land? Hmm. We're all heaven oriented. Now, I could take four days on this and talk to you about the place on earth and God's eschatology and this eschatological future, but Peter does it for me in one verse here. We, according to that promise, are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Now, when you go researching that, you come up with quotes like, like this, this classic, and from the classic and, and the recently read. It says the dualism of heaven and earth is not retained after Revelation 121 for the New Jerusalem, as should be 2121, sorry. The New Jerusalem has come down out of heaven, so that now is the time of consummation. Behold, the indwelling of God is with men. It's right there. The heavenly order is now subsumed in a terrestrial kingdom where all things are new. What's he saying then? The heaven and earth dichotomy is now subsumed. And so what you have is a veil between where is heaven? Where is heaven? Anyway, now you know that's not a valid question. Heaven's up, right? Now, that's a metaphorical thing. It's just to accommodate our thinking. Heaven is, well, well, to the Australians, in those terms, the heaven's down. Now, I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just saying that God accommodates revelation to our concept of up and down. So heaven's up and we, we it's up there. And hell's down there in the core of the earth. But probably the whole new insight and in, uh, in physics should help us with heaven. Heaven may be right there, right in front of us, right there. I don't know. Well, there, really? May as well be. Where did Jesus go when he disappeared? Where did he leave? He walked in and out of things all the time after he was raised from the dead. And my suggestion to you based on this is the final of the heaven and earth, the veil between them will be taken away. And the heaven and the earth will conjunct. They'll conjunct and it will be a vast cosmic and to be a megaloptilist. This is to say that I wish I could start with this <laughs> And I probably shouldn't have started with it. I can't tell you everything I believe. I want to believe in this. Because it's really not. Well, if I challenge you to think, good. Even if we don't agree on it. That's worth a little bit, huh? But I want to ask you something. Spend a little time on the research of the new heaven and the new earth. You need to do that. You need to do it for yourself. Just look it up. Adjust yourself to the new heaven concept. You know, 
personally, I always had a little problem about uh, cold gold streets, bare feet, wrapped in a white cloth, <laughs> white sheet, singing with a harp. Uh, it didn't look like it was exciting to me. <laughs> There's got to be more to it. Uh, uh, that uh, complete. If God made the earth a man, he couldn't make a better earth, huh? Earth is our habitat. It's a small heaven. It's beautiful. Earth is heaven's order. God's original intent that was that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's his original intent. And the final eschatological reality, heaven and earth will be one. And we're going to live in it. Trees without bumps and lumps and bugs and death and bodies without the same heredity of disease and animals that don't bite. Well, that's the way I think about it. And there you go. There's enough damage done. <laughs> okay. Father, open our minds to see this, I pray. Heal us, Lord. A lot of us need healing right now and comfort. There's wars all over the world right now. It looks like we're about to be sucked into one. Make us to know and understand that you're in charge. You are. And we got a job to do. And to stop waiting to get raptured out of here and get with the program. All we got to do is go to prayer and say, Father, where do you want me and what do you want me to do? You'll supply my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Many of you had plans, your own plans. They weren't God's plans. You did what you're supposed to go to college or not go to college or take up a job and raise a family and so forth and so on. But you never did ask Jesus what to do. Some people have got themselves so bound up they couldn't do it if God did tell them to do it. Well, they could, but the devastation of destruction to their lives, you're going to suffer. You just are. Jesus is the head. Father, we thank you for the wonderful things that you've done for us, giving us wisdom and insight into your word. We ask you in Jesus' name that you just take care of us all the way around. We thank you, Lord. This is Mike. Jesus is Lord. I'll see you next time.